Welcome to a live episode of Surviving the Survivor. We bring you the best guests in all of true crime. Don't forget to subscribe and smash that like button. Here's your host, Emmy Award-winning broadcaster, Joel Walton. What's up, STS Nation, and welcome to another episode of Surviving the Survivor, the podcast that promises to bring you the very best guests in all of true crime and today is the top tier of our best guests and they are here in the flesh dave arenberg will be joining momentarily he is the florida the current florida state attorney after all and uh finishing up some business and he will be here but just to recap quickly after nine plus years donna adelson as we all know by now she appeared in a tallahassee courtroom to hear the charges levied against her including murder in the conspiracy to kill her ex-son-in-law, FSU law professor Dan Markell. The following day, her son Charlie Adelson was sentenced to life in prison without parole. Uh, He's at an intake center in Chipley, Florida, in the panhandle as we speak. But Charlie's jailhouse calls have been left behind for the public, the ones that he made in the Leon County Jail. And they're making some people wonder if Donna and Charlie could turn on their once beloved daughter and sister, Wendy. Uh, Best guest today, Dave Arenberg, who will be here momentarily, as I said, is the state attorney for Palm Beach County. Uh, He's also a former member of the Florida Senate. He was elected to the Senate in 2002 as its youngest member, where he served for eight years. And he's a graduate of Harvard undergrad and Harvard Law. And that's how he got to know personally Dan Markell while up in Tallahassee. Uh, The next voice, maybe even more so than the face, you know well, and that is Dennis Murphy. He is the winner of four national Emmys for Excellence in News Reporting. He's best known for regular contributions to NBC News, NBC Nightly News, Dateline NBC, The Today Show, and NBC News at Sunrise. He, of course is all over Dateline NBC, and uh, my audio is about to improve slightly because I had it on the wrong setting. So uh, Dennis Murphy, uh, of course, a staple with Dateline NBC over their amazing run over the last three decades. He covered the Dan Markell murder case uh, from the beginning, and now he's a contributor to Dateline NBC. He officially uh, has retired, and he deserves it, but he's still working on select episodes. Last but not least, coming to us from Florida as well today, as he's getting ready for some vacation, is John Singer, co-founder of Singer Deutsch LLP, a graduate of the Georgetown Law Center. He's been a super lawyer as many years as I've been alive. And he corrected me. He knows all New England Patriots, uh, miscellaneous nonsensical information <laughs> dating back to 1976 right. nevertheless he does know it. a quick uh reminder to everyone please support us on patreon or youtube if you can't do that please give us five stars on audio you have no idea how how far that goes in helping us the merch store is open we'll get a link up there and today the coe wanted me to put this up Cannot thank STS Nation, say it all the time, best guest, better community. Today, we hit 90,000 subs, and we are over it. Next stop is 100,000 subs, and I've got to tell you, we've done this in literally just about a year's time. We started in earnest in true crime last November, so uh, basically 13 months. Uh, Last but not least for announcements, and then we're going to dig into it, there is this. Two of the people on here, Dave Arenberg and Dennis Murphy, are going to be present at this. It's called Perspectives on Trial Life. It is not too late to get tickets. It's this Wednesday in Sunrise, Florida. I will again post it to my Twitter account, at Podcast STS. I will also put it on our Instagram page, at Surviving the Survivor. It's a chance to meet Dennis Murphy in person, Dave Arenberg in person, Ruth Markell will be the uh, marquee speaker here. She is uh, going to be at the center of it all, and yours truly will be moderating it. Uh, Catherine Regier from uh, Maui. Did I just miss her? I, I kept I miss people on this chat. 
it's moving too much. But uh, she said, good news travels fast. Congrats, guys. Amazing. I want to bring up something. Um, this just breaks my heart, actually. Uh, and it was from it's from Prof's blog, which is Dan Markell's blog. And it's dated 2005. Just like to get Dennis um, and John's take on this goes under the, the the heading, I guess, of be careful what you wish for. But this mm. is Dan Markell writing this back in 2005. Anyway, lots to catch up on, but I thought I'd report first on the most important development in my life that occurred recently last Thursday night in a little village called Hodness, a.k.a. Hodness, which overlooks the Kinneret Sea of Galilee. I became the luckiest guy on earth. Wendy Adelson agreed to marry me. She now wears what she likes to call a big girl ring, which I find has proven a worthwhile investment in terms of its deterrent powers alone. All I can say is, wow, did I win the lottery of life? And it is a sentiment with which my friends and family eagerly share. John Singer, it'd be nine years later that his life would uh, be snuffed out uh, these are very haunting words. What's it like for you to see these? Mm. They are. I mean, I, I think a, a portion of this uh, blog entry was um, featured in the Over My Dead Body podcast. So they they had honed in on this um, back in 19 when that podcast hit. And the words are haunting and um, they're, they're quite sad. Um, I think he thought that he had found um, the woman of his dreams. Uh, she was everything for which he could have hoped beautiful, smart, Jewish, came from ostensibly a good family, somebody uh, who his parents uh, admittedly approved of, um, and things, as Wendy testified to in, in all three trials, uh, were problematic even before the wedding. So the wedding was in February of, 20, uh, of 2006, and this was in May of 05. So sometime in the intervening period between these beautiful words and uh, their wedding in Boca Raton, uh, the relationship started to go sideways, and obviously children uh, did not fix that. And in fact, the children, uh, ultimately, the situation with the children uh, were what led to uh, Dan's demise. So very haunting and sad words indeed. And uh, Dennis, you know, I can't, uh, it's probably innumerable, the, the amount of shows you've done on couples whose marriages have gone south and sideways and every other which way. Uh, what do you make of these words? You've obviously seen once strong marriages or what were believed to be strong marriages completely fall apart. Joel, I look at this and I wish I could just stop the movie in place because there's so much grief to come, but you can't do it. I, I tend to think in metaphor and to me, a, a homicide, this one or any anyone is, it's like you're out looking at a, a beautiful still lake and then suddenly someone throws a rock into the water and ripples start going out. That's the homicide. But it doesn't stop with the victim because the ripples keep going. And then it takes in the parents and the friends and the law enforcement people are, are, are rolled out. And the ripples just keep going on and on. So I, I think of this as that awful stone that was tossed in the water here. And yes. There's just, but, just no stopping. And all the grief that's happened for, for poor Ruth and, and Phil. Mm. Yeah. And by the way, um, one of the best written shows, news shows you will ever see is Dateline, and it's because of Dennis Murphy, Murphy oh. Keith Morrison, and Josh Mankiewicz. Those three are amazing, amazing writers. You, you heard the way he just explained that. So if you're ever interested in TV news and how to write for it, because there's a skill set for that, Dennis Murphy, Keith Morrison, Josh Mankiewicz, th oh, those yeah. guys are the, tr the triad for that. I agree, so, with, uh, agree with every word you said, Joel. I mean, they are just the best of colleagues. Yeah, they're, they're amazing. Penny, Penny Bright. Yeah. Um, so, uh, John Singer, we're going to pop into this question right away. By the way, Bonnie Lee Lopez, one of your biggest fans, John Singer. I got uh, many tweets and texts today saying, John Singer is the most quality guest you can get. And I tend to believe <laughs> uh, that in a lot of ways. Do you feel Dan Rashbaum is going to present the same ridiculous extortion defense for Donna? But before we get there, John Singer... Do you think he's even going to be representing Donna, or at least in some capacity? I mean, the, the jailhouse calls are very praiseworthy and, and laudatory of the job that, that Dan Rashbaum did. And lots of those words derive from Donna. Donna said on several of those calls, she spent hours upon hours on the phone with Dan, uh, as well as Dan's wife, 
um, in the months antecedent to the trial. So it's a good question whether or not Dan professionally, ethically can even represent Donna. He's clearly more impressive from what I've seen uh, than her present attorney, although in fairness, the present attorney hasn't had a lot to do so far. But um, I, I think they're stuck with that defense, um, no matter who is his is her attorney, whether it's her present attorney or Dan Rashbaum, they're stuck with the defense. The defense has been mm-hmm. tendered. That, in my opinion, is going to be the same defense Donna is going to go with. I think Donna, it, it, we'll get into this, obviously, but if you listen to the jailhouse uh, calls, I mean, there's no way in the world she thinks she's going to get uh, found not guilty or um, acquitted of this murder. Uh, Charlie makes it clear, and she is in concurrence, that if you try this case 200 times in Tallahassee, you'd have 200 convictions, that there is no way an Adelson is going to get acquitted in that jurisdiction. And that includes her. So whatever she, whatever they go with, it's, it's not going to make a, a difference. She's going to get convicted. John, I'm curious if you ticked off the points we know about her going in now. Everyone's a innocent until proven guilty. Uh, but, but what, I mean, there are the, all of the checks that were written at the Adelson Institute. What are their, Joel, I go to you as the keeper of facts in all of this. Uh, 400 checks that she wrote to Magbanoa? John, you know, John would know this better than me, actually. I don't know the exact number, but it's a lot. I, I don't know the exact number. I know it was about $17,000 and many of them were consecutive checks. Um, uh, they were all signed by Don Adelson. I, I actually think there's stronger evidence against Donna than, than just the checks. I think it's the wiretaps, it's the vitriolic emails, but, but ultimately it's the wiretaps. Her one statement on the first wiretap after the bump to Charlie that this matter involves the two of us I think, I think you know what I'm. T- I think you know what I'm talking about. That's the death knell for her. I, I think mean, that's sacred night evidence. I, I, yeah. I don't know what. You, how do you? How do you counterpunch that? Yeah, and we're and we're going to play don't. another. We're going to play the uh, extradition call tonight. Which and, and guys, uh, well, just the, the circumstances in which Donna was taken down is that something like an admission of guilt? I, I think it evidence you're trying to flee to a country without extradition. Yeah, I mean, I, I think it evidences consciousness of guilt, and I, I think that. The jailhouse calls are interesting because I, I've heard probably six or seven hours worth. They're, they're insufferable to listen to because it's mm. Charlie just repetitive. It doesn't matter who he's speaking to, whether it's his present girlfriend, whether it's the mother of his child, whether it's his mother, his boat keeper, whoever it is, it's the same stuff over and over again. But what's pretty clear is Charlie and Donna are in 100% full accord that no Adelson is going to get acquitted in Tallahassee. Now, that is something that Donna could probably use offensively. She could probably say that I was fleeing because the notoriety of the case and the publicity were such that I'd be convicted regardless of the evidence. So on the one hand, it shows consciousness of guilt. But if you listen to the tapes in in concordance with the uh, attempt to flee, she's going to argue that was simply an acknowledgement that the publicity was such that no Adelson could ever expect a fair trial in Tallahassee. It was, in the words of Charlie Adelson, ad nauseum on those tapes, it was the Tallahassee Super Bowl. Mm-hmm. Guys, it's it's not evidence, but the, the phone call that makes the hair in the back of my neck stand up is after the bump, Donna in one of these is, is talking to Charlie. I think he's outside the house, she's inside. And you can hear the children. There she is yeah. saying, well, the, the, I'm getting ready for the bath now. And you realize if this was a fairy tale, it would have begun, begun once upon a time. There were two children and it's about the two children. And there she is. She has control what? of them. She won. She got exactly what she wanted at the discount. If you believe the prosecutor and everything is bracketed here, according to the prosecution, prosecution, they didn't have to pay Dan a million dollars to go away. They just had to pay the knuckle draggers a hundred thousand dollars. And it was a done deal. And there are the kids voices in the background. How painful and, and, be for it, Ruth. And by the way, they're saying, uh, John, by the way, before we get to that, NJ Cool Chick, 67, important because she's she's from my home state, but she's also, more importantly, from Dennis Murphy's home state. Dennis from Hohokus, if I remember All correctly. Right. So shout out to uh, NJ Cool Chick. New Jersey is in the house. Uh, Chelsea Whitaker saying, I uh, hope we're getting to 100,000 by New Year's. It's going to be a lot to get to by New Year's, but uh, I have faith in uh, STS Nation boosting those uh, numbers. Uh 
this is a very sensitive subject for uh, John Singer <laughs> here. Wants to know if Bill Belichick will be there from Ned Smith. Um, Aston, Aston answered before we came on, huh? Yeah, <laughs> yes. we were talking about what it behind we, Well, the let's scenes. put you on the spot, John. What's the deal? What's going on there? I think the Crafts have made their decision, and it's goodbye, Bill. They're going to try to do it amicably, but these things can always go sideways. The Crafts want to yeah. lever it. But I don't know. I know we didn't come to talk about that. So I could go on for hours on that one. You could. We'll get you back on just to do a New England Patriots. I'll just ask you questions from 76 on, but that's not what today is about. <laughs> so, um, you know, we saw Donna in her uh, arraignment, and it was striking to me, uh, John Singer, not just because of these looks on her face, but she was just, you got a real glimpse into her controlling nature during this arraignment, you know, and at one point, even Judge Stephen Everett, who, by the way, handled the Charlie Adelson case masterfully, he basically told her to pipe down during this arraignment. He said she was talking too much to leave the talking up uh, to her attorneys. What's it like, John, you know, if you're representing someone and the attorney and the judge is now scolding your client? That is never a good look, is it? No. And and I think the one thing we, we all have clients like that who are sort of chirping in our ear. Um and it's especially distracting. It, it happens more often than not when um, I'm attempting to examine a witness. And when you're cross-examining somebody, it's it's obviously hard work. You had to think on your feet. It's very extemporaneous. And you have somebody concurrently chirping in your ear. And I just politely tell the client to, you know, shut the F up and we'll talk at the break because it's very irritating, not only to the lawyer, but also to the finder of fact. It, it really can be quite off-putting. Hmm. Look at this from Yala. I saw I saw Joel's pics uh, on Instagram with his son and their haircut. We get haircuts every once in a while. The son definitely gets his looks from the COE, my wife. Hmm. Um, I'm, I'm taking issue with that. And uh, I might have John Singer draft up some uh, legal papers to send your way. Uh, let's hit that like button. Uh, to you, Dennis, I mean, since we last talked, so much has happened. I mean, oh, just in the last couple of Charlie, weeks. Charlie hadn't been busted yet, Joel. Charlie hadn't been busted He's now a convicted killer, and Donna is busted. Did you ever think, Dennis, it would happen as quickly as it did with Donna? The speed, I my my teeth dropped out. I was sitting out back reading my paper, having a coffee, mm -hmm. and I got on the phone, and it said Donna Adelson has been arrested. Could not believe it. Now people, you know, had twelve hours heads up on it. I was not one of them, but I just could not believe because what we were only a week, eight days past Charlie's conviction. Yeah, yeah, it was one yes. week. Was and one week. and the whole and the circumstances that I mean, I'm a I'm a news guy, I'm a story guy. I don't have to deal with the, the legals, but this conference here they are with the eight o'clock flight to Dubai loading up at MIA, mm -hmm. and they're on the jetway in that confined area. And here comes this great FBI guy saying, Give me your phone, and uh, he's you know, just about to read her, her rights, and the husband is there. And so I mean, what a takedown. It was so dramatic. Charged with first a mirror, and so can somebody call uh, a Harvey here an Uber, you know, to go home? So <laughs> here's the uh, other star of the show, Dave Arenberg, the current sitting Florida state attorney. I'm not getting into politics on this show, no way, no how. However, it's interesting. Uh, I will say this, Dave Arenberg, and let's keep it brief because then I'll start to get the hate mail from both sides. But the <laughs> Adelsons were actually talking about your friend, Donald Trump, in your county. Um, that they thought he was masterful for not uh, attending any of the debates, that he was handling things well. Um, I don't know if you caught that, but are you surprised that the Adelsons were talking? Uh, uh, I kid, by the way. Uh, Dave Arenberg is a Democrat, and and Donald Trump lives in his county. What do you make of the fact that they were talking about the the biggest name besides you, Dave Arenberg, in Palm Beach County? <laughs> besides Dennis Murphy. What a get to have this a national that's figure a, on the show. It's a huge Joel. get. Huge get. I, but I can't, you know I've, what? I got to tell you, I, I checked on the on the, the tw Twitter. I won't call it by its new name. And uh, it was John Singer who someone responded, hey, you need to have him on the show more because he's your best guest of all. So, <laughs> so Dave, there you we, go. We, I'm honored to be with this esteemed panel. Um, thank you for taking that picture off the screen of Donna. That is not the most flattering picture I've seen of her. It's a little Cro Magnon uh, style there. That's not a good picture for her. Yeah, uh, Dave, I Dave can I can I thank you personally for putting Dahlia DiPolito on trial? She has become a gift that keeps on giving for me. If I had residuals from that prosecution and that resulting story, I'd be a rich guy. 
<laughs> Dennis, my county hits above its weight. We had Dolly DiPolito. We also had a, a much about Corey Lewandowski, Robert Kraft, Dennis Rodman, Rod mm. Stewart. I mean, Robert Kraft, cool. yeah. Jeffrey Epstein, <laughs> years before I got there. Years before I got there, but yeah. So, Dave, uh, by the way, uh, Dave, as big a uh, Dolphins and, uh, you know, all things Miami fan you are, singer is exponentially more when it comes to the New England Patriots. So when you said Bob Kraft, his ears perked up right there. Um, they did. They did indeed. My buddy was representing him, so I know the whole – I remember the whole saga. <laughs> we, can, oh, well, we can talk about that off the <laughs> Yes. Uh, you yes. know what, though? So yesterday was a strange day for us Dolphins fans. We were rooting for the Patriots for one of the few times, and yet they were close for a while. It didn't, didn't happen, unfortunately. I was um, rooting against – and we were rooting against them because we want the ba better draft pick. So it's, uh, it's an unusual – we're all un in a very unusual place right now. That's football. For years, fans. I started to call them my area code team rather than the Miami Dolphins. Because, <laughs> you know, since the end of Shula and, and uh, Dan Marino, I, I sort of fell away. And now I feel bad because I should have been with them in the fallow years. Now that it's the, the years of fat cows, uh, I feel bad for, for dissing them in the past. <laughs> but they're exciting to watch, and they're back in the last couple of weeks. Yes, I, I love it. The fallow years. <laughs> <I love it. laughs> um, John Singer, for you, from Lori Gregory, there yep. is more against Wendy and evidence of her knowing, and we'll, we're going to play a few calls, and evidence of her knowing what was coming than Charlie. Why did they charge Charlie first and allow her to avoid jail? Uh, I don't think you well, really see it this way, but your answer. No, no. I mean, I, I, I don't. I think that, you know, I assume we're all in accord or, or, or many of us are in accord that the evidence is strongest against Charlie first. Um, and then just slightly behind Charlie is Donna. And one could argue that they're 1A, 1B, uh, however you see it. Wendy has been, is trickier. Um, th there's lots of discord on whether or not you could get a prosecution of Wendy beyond a reasonable doubt. I, I am of the mindset that she's guilty. Uh, others are of the mindset that she's guilty, but you may not be able to prove it. But Wendy certainly is is a a, a distant third as far as the evidentiary evidentiary proof that they have against the Adelson family. Harvey, do you have to believe I that she's been living? Do you have to believe she's been living job behind firewalls and it's been kept from her? There must no. be accessory after the fact kind of considerations. Right? How could she not know for nine years? For sure. And, and I do think that, that Wendy, I, I think it initially uh, the plan was hatched by Donna and Charlie. It was, it was, I've always said this from the beginning. It was done for Donna, first and foremost. Donna did not want to drive eight hours every single weekend to see the grandchildren. She was not going to tolerate that. The Adelsons were not going to do that for the 16 years that it took for the, the second child to get into college. They were hell bent on getting the kids back. I think Wendy gave her imprimatur at some point. She took a couple of overt acts, I would argue, in furtherance of the conspiracy. But at the end of the day, the plan was originally um, hatched between Donna and Charlie, is, is my belief. Others may certainly disagree. In, in my mind, she has bumped ahead, Charlie as, the, as the, master, the mastermind of this whole thing. She is the, she's the architect of this thing. Charlie, Charlie and Donna have such an unusual relationship, and, and I think we all knew that ahead of time. And now that the jailhouse calls have been published, we, we've gotten a window into that. It's, it's a very unusually close and odd relationship uh, that you typically don't see. I mean, between – I know Joel has stated that, that he and Karm have uh, a very close relationship, but, but this, one this one crosses the line between normalcy and, and something else. Um, and, and I think that the two of them were on the phone for hours upon hours and Donna was complaining and Charlie said, you know what? I can get this problem taken care of. And they, and that's how it was. And Wendy eventually I think was, was clued in on what was happening. They weren't going to kill the father of, of her children uh, without making her aware of it. But to what extent she was aware of the planning and when is still pretty opaque. And my By favorite way, moment John, from Georgia Kappelman was during the close, that kind of whip snap of the wet towel. And by the way, jurors, he's a mama's boy. That's all you need to know. Yeah. Think about that. Yes. And it starts to explain itself. By yes. the by the way, we're uh, we're we're pretty dysfunctional, but I don't think we crossed the murder line. So, uh, but uh, no. definitely def definitely crossed the dysfunction line. Uh, Miss Wee Lassie joins us from Scotland. I, I was absolutely amazed at. Uh, 
the amount of different countries on one of our chats last week. We, we literally had Gambia, India, Mexico, Australia, New Zealand. The list went on and on and on. But Miss Wielasi is a friend of the show from Scotland. Dave Ehrenberg, to you, regarding Donna's trial, could she ask for jurors to be brought in from out of the area? Thank you. Uh, this is coming up because her and Charlie are essentially, after sort of bad-mouthing uh, Tallahassee as a, uh, as a small, big town, they said they'll never get a fair trial there. Uh, what say you, Dave? Yeah, it's up to the judge whether the judge believes that she could get a fair trial. And it is a fair point that she has bad-mouthed the community where the trial is going to be for years. And look, they didn't like Charlie in part because here you have this family from Miami and those of us who have lived in both places. I've lived in Miami and Tallahassee. Tallahassee looks at Miami as just a bunch of overly slick, big city folk who look down upon the small town and the panhandle. It's like eight hours away. So it's night and day. And when you have a theory of the case, which to me is true, as you guys have all said, where you have a local family who plotted to kill Wendy's husband because they did not want the kids raised in Tallahassee. Oh, man, that is a good reason, I think, to try to get either the trial moved out of Tallahassee or to get a jury brought in from elsewhere. I think that's legitimate uh, argument. I don't think that Charlie requested that, and I think perhaps he should have. Now, look, the evidence to me, as John said, it's really strong against both Charlie and against Donna. I think the reason why they haven't charged Wendy yet is because prosecutors, we have a higher burden to reach. We don't charge based on probable cause. Police make an arrest based on probable cause. We charge based on a belief in good faith that we can get a conviction beyond a reasonable doubt. It's a higher hmm. burden. And I think if they thought they had evidence right now against Wendy, they would go. But also, I think they're also getting more evidence as the days go on. I mean, I listened to that jail call. And I don't know if you've spoken about it, Joel, where uh, Donna was on the phone with Charlie and was reading the text from Wendy. Yeah, and then, yeah the text. Right. And then yeah. she it was played to me. I didn't see it elsewhere, but where she says like bullshit or something about Wendy saying that she had nothing to do with it. I, I'm sure you brought up. And, we I mean, we, we have the, I'm, I'm going to play that call in a moment. It that but, as far as far as I know that, you know, people people who have much better listening skills than me and ways to enhance the audio say that Donna was actually supporting Wendy's innocence, but we're, we're going to play it. Sure. Okay. And also before I, I stop, can I just comment Joe Simpson? She's got great taste in men. Thank you, Joe. And to Barbie and Tiffany and all the nice comments, you're making me feel the love. I'm grateful to all of you. You've got <laughs> the best audience, Joel Walton. Yes, I do. And uh, this is a big comeback for you, Dave, after the lawyer you know was on with you, Peter Tragos, and he got a tremendous amount of love. Now it is Dave's turn. Look at this. Hey, Mo, would you ever run for president, Dave Ehrenberg? There you are. President of what? Of the United States of America, <laughs> oh, Mr. <laughs> president. Would you ever run? I, I, the thing is, I live in a, um, a red state, and as a Democrat, it's very hard to win a statewide office these days. But my future in politics is not over yet. I mean, I'm not running for re-election here, but maybe the future or maybe, you know, we can do more podcasting because I love this stuff. I love connecting with the people about this. Very uh, interesting topics. And no true crime case that I've seen is more interesting than this one. Dave, as a 15-year-old, tell us honestly, did you say to your parents, one day I'm going to be the first Jewish president of the United States? <laughs> it's okay. Things change. But did you ever utter those words? I never uttered those words, but mom, as many Jewish mothers do, she was the one who said, yeah, I'm going to be the first Jewish president. Life gets in the way, though. Dave, you make us all proud. Look at this. Another one. Love Dave Ehrenberg. Uh, Dennis Murphy, uh, we can't ask any other guests but uh, you this question. Uh, will there now be a Dateline Part 2? Uh, take us behind the scenes of Dateline. I mean, you guys had just aired an episode, and all of a sudden – Charlie's convicted and the mother is arrested. No, none of your producers could have predicted this. So what's in the works now? The gears are moving very quickly and we got a little WD-40 and we're packing lunch and we're going to get it ready. I can't, I would say tune your, tune your, uh, your, your DVR to middle of January. I think we're going to have a, another one. You know, the way I, I think of this, this whole thing, when I step back, this has been like the Super Bowl of true crime sagas in, mm -hmm. in South Florida. And it started off as what I think of as CSI Tallahassee, right? It's this 
police procedural case of doing the uh, rounding up all the uh, the cell phone dumps and the, uh, the the mails and they they finally they got the three of them and that's the end of CSI Tallahassee now we're into absolutely shakespearean stuff the killer family as we all believe they get the son now we've got the mother trying to flee on the lamb and we're wondering if Harvey should be waiting for a shoe to drop. We're waiting to see if Wendy should be waiting for a shoe to drop. It's an, you know, it's it's a it's an awful crime. It's a heinous thing that happened, and I feel awful as I can for Ruth and Phil. But it is a great story. It's got legs and it plays. And now we're going into extra overtime. It's going to be the Shakespearean. We're past CSI now. It's Shakespeare. Uh, Dennis, I needed you as my attorney. Um, people are going to make fun of me because I'm once again mentioning Nancy Grace, but she asked me to do her podcast. Huh. And off camera, she was saying that this is probably one of the top two most incredible stories she's ever covered in her tenure as a true crime icon. Then I got on and I said, this is a fascinating story. And she cut me off right away, Dennis. And she said that I was, uh, Aaron Berg was with me on that show. She she's not me. wrong. She cut me right off and she might have just cut you off because she wants us to remember the victims. Of course, we always do. Dan Markell. And by the way, someone pointed this out. It's not just uh, the Markell boys, although they are at the, you know, the, the epicenter of this. But you've got the hit men's kids and you've got even Charlie Adelson has a son. Mm -hmm. There's so many families. Just the rock and the lake and it's making ripples, ripples, ripples. A hundred percent. Great analogy. And uh, the damage has been done here. And by the way, this week, Ruth is supposed to meet with her grandchildren. And I hope that, in fact, that is happening and on schedule. Mm -hmm. uh, there is pressure on Wendy to make sure that, you know, that happens. So I hope um, that works out for Ruth and for her benefit. Um, very quickly, I'm just going to put this back up for a quick second now that Dave is here. Dave Arenberg, myself, and Dennis Murphy are going to be at Jafco in Sunrise. Um, and I saw the venue. It's a beautiful venue. Uh, it's an, obviously a chance to meet Dennis Murphy at Dateline. You don't get to do that often. Or Dave Arenberg, future president of the United <laughs> States of Gambia. Um, <laughs> he will be there. And um, John Singer won't be there because John Singer, of the three of us, is the real baller. He's going to be on a yacht somewhere in the middle of St. Bart's. Where are you going, John <laughs> Singer? Punta, I'm going to Punta Mita uh, after we do the grandparent duty down here in South Florida. We've got uh the kids have four grandparents three step grandparents lots mm. of siblings cousins and then we have a real vacation in mexico after this so well, just keep the you grandmother go, that's the way to go you gotta watch you always gotta watch the grandmother that's all i can tell you um, <laughs> yeah. dave arenberg to you um donna i think you got on a little late for this but donna uh you saw the photo but i don't know that you knew we were talking about this she was really um something to behold during her arraignment she couldn't keep that uh mouth shut. She was talking. You could really get a sense of the controlling nature of the, you know, kind of mommy knows best attitude that she has or grandma knows best. Uh, but at one point, Judge Everett said, OK, let's schedule this case hearing for February or March. And Maricel Descalzo, the Miami attorney representing her for the time being, said, ah, uh, 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 Donna Adelson wants to take this to trial right away. Can we have the the next case hearing in January, I believe it's scheduled for January 9th. Is she making some sort of fatal flaw, Donna Adelson, by rushing this too much? Normally, when you invoke speedy trial, as is your right as a defendant, it helps the defendant because you catch the prosecutors off guard. Prosecutors at the state level have hundreds of cases, and it's something that prosecutors don't always love to do, to rush it and to base it on the defendant's schedule. But here advantage to the prosecutors because they already tried this case. They tried it when they put Charlie on the stand. They've been living this case for so long. They could try it tomorrow, I'm convinced. And the only reason why I think Donna wants it to be rushed is because she wants this to be resolved ASAP. She hates where she is. She wants out of there. And I'm sure Charlie has told her like he believed that, oh, you're going to escape. They got nothing. But it is reality is going to hit her hard because they got a good case against her, and the jury there is not going to like her. So, yes, maybe her only chance is to bus in a jury from elsewhere. But either way, I don't see her getting away with this. I don't see this as even a Katie Magbanua-style hung jury. I think she's going down with a quick guilty verdict like her son. Wow. Will um, it go to trial, guys? Will there be a trial? She would be smart, I think, to try to cop a plea 
But for a family that doesn't, that still maintains her innocence, I mean, Charlie still to this day maintains his innocence. Wendy is totally in, uh, stating her innocence. Um, Catherine, McBan Catherine McBanawa stated her innocence until finally she relented like on uh, Charlie's trial. But I think they're going to go down with the ship. I think she should settle. She won't. They'll go to trial. She'll be like, hey, look, I'm an old lady. You think mm -hmm. I could do something like this? And then she'll be found guilty. And then uh, I think it'll be interesting to see whether anyone speaks up then. Because I think if anyone does, it would be Charlie selling out Wendy. After all, Wendy quickly threw Charlie under the bus as soon as she was interviewed the first time. I just don't see that Donna would sell anyone else out in the family. Maybe Harvey, but a mother doesn't do that <laughs> to her privileged <laughs> child or children. Yeah. John Singer, um, I spoke to a source that is very closely connected to uh, the Adelson side of this. Uh, and that person tells me that Charlie is 100% convinced of his innocent and believes in that extortion that he was extorted is this a case of oj simpsonitis where he has talked himself into believing <laughs> that he is innocent what what's really going on here do you think it, it you know it's interesting i mean if, if you listen to the jailhouse calls and again it's it's mostly the same themes are, are repeated over and over again charlie is talking about how much he hates the prosecutor how much the evidence was what he called a cut and paste job, how they took things out of context, how Ryan Fitzpatrick really wasn't his best friend, how Wendy's book um, was taken out of context. Everything was just a coincidence with the TV. I, I don't know if he is convinced himself that he's innocent. Uh, he knows he's being taped. He knows that the calls are on a recorded line because if you listen to some of them, he is quick to stop the person on the other line from going too far. So he's on the phone with um, uh, one person, I think it was his present girlfriend, Janice, and she talks about um, Katie and isn't he mad at Katie for the way she testified and Charlie was quick to cut her off and say, look, I'm, um, you know, I can't talk about that right now. But, you know, the one thing that, that leads me to believe he knows he's guilty and, and hasn't deluded himself too much is he speaks with lots of disdain and derision towards Georgia Kappelman, but he doesn't speak about her in an angry way, right? If he were innocent, truly innocent, which he's not, mm. but if he were, he would be so angry at Georgia Kappelman for putting him behind bars for the rest of his natural life. Instead, he sort of is derisive towards her, sort of mocks her small town um, accent, mocks the way she took things out of context, the way she dumbed it down, in his words, in a two-hour closing for a very sympathetic jury. But he's not angry towards her. It, it never comes across as him saying, I can't believe what she did to me. It's more, it, it's, it's more in a derisive way. But just to pick up on one thing Dave said, I, I agree with Dave 100% that the prosecutors could try this case tomorrow. This is the fourth time they're going to be trying the same case. We're just minor iterations. To Georgia just has fit. to turn this deck of cards over again. It, exactly, because a lot of the case has to be put on from scratch, as if because it's a totally new jury, you've got to put on Mr. Geiger, the neighbor, yeah. you've got to put on evidence of the Prius, you've got to put on evidence of the murder. But all the emails have already been in, all the checks have been in that Donna wrote. They could try it tomorrow. But but the one thing I would I would quarrel with is I think Donna wants this quickly because she wants this over. I don't think she thinks she's going home. She knew from those calls with Charlie that the Adelsons are dead to rights in Tallahassee, that no jury is going to buy what they are selling. I think the anticipatory anxiety for her is worse than the reality of what's coming. I think she wants it over with. Whether she makes it to trial, and I've made this statement before, what does she have to live for at this point? She's never going to see any of her grandchildren again. She bemoaned the fact that she doesn't talk to Rob, that her favorite son, Charlie, is in jail for the rest of his life, that her daughter didn't have the decency to pick up the phone and call her. She's never going to see her five grandchildren ever again. She's got nothing to live for. I think she wants this over with. I, I would be, I still maintain that I would be surprised if she's able to withstand this pressure and make it to trial. Uh, time is going to tell on that. Dennis, 
uh, you, you guys at Dateline of the Masters of the Prison slash Jailhouse interviews. I'm just curious, percentage wise, the times you've done those interviews, people behind bars, how many times have they admitted to their guilt? And what what is the psychology here where people just refuse to say that they've done it? And furthermore, that they're innocent, which is what uh, Charlie is. Charlie, although, has not really said that. He's just complaining about everything under the sun. But to John's point earlier, if I was innocent, I'd be screaming at my mother. I'm innocent. I'm innocent. I didn't do this. Why am I, you know, why am I behind the bars? But Dennis, of those uh, many times you've done those interviews, what percentage of the people say, yeah, I did it? Never. They never give it up. They're all, they're all innocent, wrongfully charged, wrongfully accused, wrongfully convicted. Uh, and I don't get great pleasure in going into the prison and sitting down with these guys because their stories are so well told, it's like a, a, a smooth river rock, and it's going to come out the same way every time. Uh, I, and, and we say, dude, just give it up. You're toast. You're done. Here's your chance right. to show remorse or tell us what actually happened. I, I came close to it with a female uh, inmate. She, she and her boyfriend came. She urged her boyfriend, who was a Texas cop, to drive all the way from the panhandle of Texas to uh, upstate New York to kill her mother, the the uh, the let's see, it was the father of her children, and she she was a manipulator. And during the in jailhouse interview, she started to give it up. She told it. She got to the. She tiptoed to the edge of remorse, but didn't quite go there. But she actually told details along the way. She's about the only person I've had it, to do that. I, I'm not a big believer in the, in the journalist jailhouse interview. It's I think it's. So you can say we were there with them, but yeah, it's kind of like going up a down escalator. You're not going to get very far. Uh, Lee Dundee to you, Dave Arenberg. Will Donna's age be a potential sympathy factor for a jury? Then we're going to play some of these tapes. Yes, I think that's one of the few things she can hold her hat on. Uh, you know, John is right about the fact that Donna wants this over. I, I do think part of her, though, does believe that she can has a chance to get away with it. I, I think she is resigned to the fact that, look, she wants us over with. She's never going to see her grandkids again. I think you're right on, John. But I do think that the fact that she's older, the fact that she's always been privileged and above the law in her mind and smarter than everyone else. I mean, look how she acted in court. That's when you're normally humbled and you're quiet. She acted like, what, Judge? You don't know what you're talking about. That's where you get that picture with her mouth wide open um, that you were showing. <laughs> and someone like that, just like her son, I think thinks they could snow a jury and get away with it. And there, there it is. I mean, that's not normally how someone would act if uh, <laughs> when they're in her situation. So yeah. that's why I think that she'll play to the jury's emotion. Look, I'm an old lady. Watch how they dress her. I'll bet you she'll wear the old granny uh, mm -hmm. clothes, glasses. They'll make sure her hair is not dyed. She'll have gray hair and she'll look like, what are we doing putting this woman behind bars? Let her go out and knit. But, you know. I, and I think, and I think Dave, I think I think that strategy worked for Mag Bonawa during the hung jury. She was done up in full Amish with those severe glasses, <laughs> and somebody would sneeze in court, and she'd say, "God bless you." And she came across like, you know, the the the, the Filipino caregiver that took care of your your aged mom. Mm -hmm. And I think that's and people said, "Oh, I don't know what the law is here, but she's got a, she's got two children, and she shouldn't have to go do time for that." So I think jurors can find a way to play this sympathy card you, you guys are talking about. Of this woman, we shouldn't do that to this woman. I, I, I agree. That's what she's going to hold out for. And you're right. All it takes is one juror, and it's a hung jury. And they're going to probably want uh, people on the jury who uh, maybe care for their elder, uh, their elder caretakers for their mm -hmm. grandparents or mothers. People have real sympathy for seniors. And they had one juror. I think it was just one in the Katie McBanawa case. But here's the thing. Even if there's a hung jury, she still goes back into jail. Exactly. So she's not getting yeah. out. The only thing she gets released is if she's acquitted. Because if there's a hung jury, they're going to do what they did with Katie Magbanawa, and they're going to do it again. And she's not going to get released on home detention pending trial. She's stuck in the cooler until this is over. You, you know wow. what's strange? You know what's strange from the jailhouse calls? There, there's sort of an inherent inconsistency that emanates from the Adelson family in the sense that both Charlie and Donna – stated that on the Sunday eve before the guilty verdict, they were supremely confident that Charlie was going to go home, that that the case had gone in very well, that Dan Rashbaum had told them each 
that the case had been presented in a much more compelling way than even he anticipated. And they were both very optimistic. Charlie had given away his food, he said, to his cellmates because he was that sure that he was going home. But out of the other side of the mouth, they're saying that no jury could ever, ever uh, find the Adelsons not guilty in Tallahassee because everybody in Tallahassee knew about this case because of the podcast, the notoriety. It was their Super Bowl the difference between Miami and Tallahassee, the chasm between the two. So out of, out of they knew this going in. It wasn't like Dan Rashbaum had kept them in the dark about how difficult it was going to be in Tallahassee for an Adelson from Miami. It, it, it wasn't as if that was new to them. So on the one hand, they were optimistic, but on the other hand, they were in full accord that Tallahassee was a terrible venue and they never had a chance. Maybe it was Monday morning quarterbacking, but – I, I, I don't know. I mean, if you listen to those calls, Donna states over and over and over again that we just can't get a fair shake here, that Charlie did move for a, a, a different venue in advance of his trial, and that was quickly denied. Um, and he said, Charlie said that he knew, and again, this is where the inconsistencies um, are really stark. Charlie said that after jury um, selection, he knew he was done because he knew that the pool was terrible and he knew he thought that people were lying. But on the other hand, he thought he was getting out on the Sunday before. So lots of lots of things that just don't match on those calls. And by the way, we're going to be talking the calls tomorrow again, 1 p.m. Eastern time. We have Peter Edwards with the Toronto Star. He just wrote a very long piece interviewing Ruth Markell. He's going to be on uh, with Gigi McKelvey of Pretty Lies and Alibis and at least one other guest tomorrow to go over. But let's listen. This is the call that most people have talked about. This is where Donna is t- uh, basically complaining about Wendy and then reading a text from Wendy. Let's take a listen together and then I'll get all three of your reactions. Here we go. Eight o'clock last night, but we just got off the phone with him. And the first thing he asked was, how's Wendy holding up? I didn't have the heart to tell him that you never called up or asked about him. I just said, we weren't up to phone calls right now. Everyone looks to protect you. I bet you've got a lot to think about. But then she didn't answer. So then I got another call from Charlie. And I said, just got off the phone with Charlie. He's worried about you. He wants to know why we didn't speak. I told him a lie. I said, we're only speaking with you and Dan right now. I couldn't bear to tell him the truth. Your sister never even called us is the truth. So she says this morning, I thought she'd be racing over here last night. Dear Mom, I know you are upset by the verdict, but the anger directed at me is not justified. I don't know how much anger we don't. I'm not responsible in any way for Charlie's situation. I am not guilty because I did not do anything wrong, and I was not involved in any way with Danny's death. When I was interviewed by the police and testified in court, I told the truth as I was required to do. I cannot control how the prosecutor used my statement to Charlie's trial. Again, I didn't say that. Also, as you know, my, I do know, my lawyer has advised me not to talk to my family or anyone else about this case. No, about the case, which is true, we've never done it. I followed his advice despite your disagreements with this guidance. Please do not text me about this case anymore. So, Dave Arenberg, to you first. The, the little that's the little piece that everyone's debating, but it's uh, Gigi actually left it out to, because she was using this for something else to let people interpret. But she's Wendy says I had no involvement, and some people think Donna then says yes, you did. Others say that she said I never said you did, uh, something along those lines. But people have basically corroborated the fact that Donna was supporting her innocence, but. Just on a broader spectrum, what do you make of this call, Dave Aaronberg? What stands out to you? When I first heard it, I thought I had heard, yes, you did. And I thought that was really damning. And remember, this call was her, Donna, reading Wendy's text message and commenting on it. And apparently, Charlie was not on the phone. He, she didn't know that she was talking into the air and it was being recorded. So I thought it was pretty damning. Now, the transcription there says differently. That says, I didn't say you did. If that's what she said, then that doesn't help the state at all. So it depends on what she said there. And maybe we should listen to it again. There's another part. The transcription is interesting. The transition, uh, the, the, uh, the transcription 
also add some words that I didn't think were in the recording. And I just, I, I think we have to be careful with that transcription. Um, and so I, I don't have an answer until we know exactly what was said. Yeah, never trust AI. Don't ever trust <laughs> AI. We'll go counterclockwise. John Singer, what do you make of that call? I, I My heart sunk a, a little bit when I heard the call because, and I listened to it twice because again, it was, it, these could have been very damning words. I heard Donna say that, that she wasn't involved. And I've seen some of the debate that's gone online about what she said or what she didn't say. To me, it was clear that she said Wendy was not involved. But the first takeaway I had was what a heartless, despicable individual Wendy Adelson <laughs> is. You don't call your parents after the guilty verdict? Like, you don't come by the house? You text them that? I mean, she, she knows that, that she knows, Wendy, from John Lauro, that whatever she has in writing with her parents is going to be used in either her mother's trial or in her ultimate trial, which, which we all anticipate is coming at some point. So that was clearly a lawyer-ridden or a lawyer-dictated text message from John Lauro. But the fact that she didn't come over the house after the guilty verdict, her, her mother of what must have been sh – I mean, she was shattered. We heard – the raw emotion coming from Donna in the wake of the guilty verdict. The first calls on November 6th are made to Donna and Harvey. Donna is crying her eyes out, right? Wendy doesn't come over. She texts her mother that. I mean, I, I don't know if anybody had that takeaway, but but I was blown away by that. I mean, we all knew sort of Wendy or, or had, a, had a sort of image of Wendy and, and what type of person she is, but... Uh, that that to me was even beyond what I would have imagined. Dennis Murphy, uh, Wendy does not stop by the house and text just to say I had nothing to do with this murder. She's an attorney, by the way, so she knows what she's doing. What did you make of it? Don't you get the feeling, Joel? Everybody's speaking to an off. Oh, there's a transcriber out here who's directly connected to the prosecutor's office, and they they shut down their speech and they say, and of course you had nothing to do with it, and then they could talk about more about what's on their mind. Of course you had nothing to do with it. I, I think almost as much as what she says is just listening to her demeanor. The character of Donna is coming across in that thing. And I'm reminded of Mag Bonawa at the, at the cafe when they, when they had her. And all of a sudden, she's throwing F-bombs. And you had a totally different Mag Bonawa than the jury had seen in court. And I think that's important. I think when you hear the way she speaks in, in, her, in her own words and chooses to talk about, I mean, you just think, what an awful person. Uh, I would have to agree with that. Uh, McRamble on for Dave Arenberg. How do you approach a defendant like Wendy when she has the type of immunity agreement she currently has, that use immunity? Yeah, use immunity is the most limited immunity. Transactional would mean you can't go after it all. And uh, derivative use and, uh, makes it a little broader. If she just has use immunity, then you just can't use what she said against her, but you can develop your own independent evidence. All the other stuff we know about her driving up to the scene of the crime. How about, I still think, to me, a really damning comment is when she texted her brother out of the blue, like, I'll never forget what you've done for me. It was, it was right around the time when the mm. murder plot was occurring, right? I, I think that doesn't get as much play as it should. And then there's other things, you know, she refers to the TV, which is the code that the whole family had for the yeah. murder. And, and then tried to allegedly set up her ex-boyfriend, Jeffrey Lacoste, trying to ask where he's going, when is, what roads are he taking, is he taking it, when is he leaving? So I think there's enough to, for, to get prosecutors really interested, whether there's enough at this point to charge her. I, I don't know, uh, but I think that there's stuff that the prosecutors have that we don't have. And I think as the case against Donna occurs, I think then they may get enough to make that decision. If she's found guilty, uh, if Donna's found guilty, which I think she will be, then prosecutors are going to be focused on Wendy. If she's not, if she's acquitted, then it's over. Then Wendy will never be charged. Um, but the fact that Wendy was given use immunity at trial does not at all prohibit prosecutors from moving ahead against Wendy. Dave, I have a question from the cheap seats about this immunity issue. Is this to say that the the areas of her story, which sound a little sketchy, have they already been testified to? Her timeline of the day, why she went to the out of the way liquor store, the whole bottle of bottle of bourbon purchase, uh, doing the doing the L turn out of the site, why she didn't stop. Have those all been exploited and and you and 
used as testimony, or can they go back and revisit the, all those all those areas? Yeah, prosecutors can go back if they but they have to develop the evidence themselves. So, for example, when she made her initial interview with police, she talked about where she went, going to the liquor mm -hmm. store. So they can go from there using that. So if Wendy says, no, you can't use that. I, I had to use immunity. Well, I said, we got That's what I wondered, yeah. Beforehand. Yeah, you can still go ahead and, and use whatever you had before and after, just not the specifics of what she said. But I think your question is, if she said something that the prosecutors already knew about, can they still go ahead with it? And the answer is yes, as long yeah. as they knew about it, other than when she testified. Uh, Dave, a bunch of people have been asking any chance Donna is offered an Alfred plea and just let everyone that essentially means that you're admitting uh, to the crime. But any chance that they get offered, she gets offered an Alfred plea. Well, the devil's in the details. If she admits it, then and she'll go to prison. I mean, I don't imagine that the prosecutors are going to allow her to just plead and then go home. I think that it's going to come with a prison time. And then the question is, will Donna admit that she did it? When the whole family, I mean, look, I know that Charlie is not as angry as you would think she'd, he would be if he was really innocent. But when he had the chance at his sentencing to stand up and cop to the crime, he still stood up and said, I did not do it. I'm an innocent man. And so I don't think that Donna is going to plead guilty to this. Uh, and uh, unless, of course, she can just go home immediately. But the prosecutors are never going to agree to that deal. Any plea that Donna will have will involve prison time. Mm. By the way, we got to get to a few more calls. John Singer, help me decipher this comment. Here's a super sticker. Thank you, SDS, for all you do. What does the panel think about Wendy stating in her first police interview that she was wonderful lying in the car on the way to the station? Which she basically was, from what I understand, she was never told that she was a suspect, but she mentions that when she gets to the interrogation with Isom, as far as I know. Um, she didn't know Dan Markell was shot at that point. Anything that you would like to add here, John Singer? No, I mean, I, I've, I've listened to that that uh, difficult five-hour and five-minute uh, <laughs> interrogation several times. And um, what, what happens there is that they pick her up at, at the restaurant. Um, she's with her two friends. They tell her nothing, apparently, because there's no audio from um, either the restaurant or from the car on the way to the police station. At the police station, they lead off or, or the or the recording leads off with Detective Isom telling her um, that there's been um, a shooting and that her ex-husband had been the victim. She goes into hysterics, um, feigned or otherwise. And then she blurts out, I think pretty quickly thereafter, that of course she's a suspect. She's the ex-wife. The ex-wife's always a suspect. So I, I don't think there's a lot of hay there. I, I do agree with Dave on what he said about um, her expressing her uh, gratitude to Charlie for all he's done for her. That was on the morning of the murder. That was, um, she was on an 18 minute phone call, I believe to, with Charlie, the morning of the murder. There was a text about from her to Charlie stating that she was um, extremely appreciative of all he had done for her. And of course that had all tied into uh, the TV repairman from the Geek Squad coming. So I, I think that that is some pretty good evidence against her. There's a lot of, of, of decent things um, that point to Wendy's guilt. Um, I think we've debated those on this show before, and I think we'll have a chance again, um, hopefully after Donna's guilty verdict. But um, I, I do agree with Dave that, that, that I, don't, I don't think there's been enough made out of that comment from Wendy. Mm. Uh, and Dave, speaking of this, uh, Brett Bressler says, um, I don't see the direct evidence against Donna Adelson. I do not see any admissible evidence that she exchanged money in exchange for the murder. Where is the direct evidence, Dave Ehrenberg? Well, it's the same evidence of Charlie. I mean, she apparently went to Charlie's home the day of the murder to drop off money. And maybe that's not direct evidence, but that's circumstantial evidence. And circumstantial evidence is good evidence. That's what we prosecutors rely on every day. And so, yeah, there may not be a direct like admission. Um, they all talked in code, but that in itself is circumstantial evidence. In fact, they all talked in the TV. I like the evidence I like against Donna, amongst others, was after the bump, she she knew That's to right. call Charlie That's to right. involve the two of us and mm -hmm. the TV. And then they go meet in secret and they're talking in code. She doesn't go to the police. She calls Charlie and says, it involves the two of us and your girlfriend. And it just, there's, too much there that's that, it right to, yeah. to believe that donna had nothing that's to do it. with it 
and, and if they convicted Charlie, how do they not convict Donna? Mm. The, ev the evidence is really, I mean, if you think about it, when I said 1A, 1B before, I think that uh, the 1A, 1B factors in, maybe there might be a sympathy factor with Donna versus Charlie, who's as unsympathetic as you get. But if, if you look at it, there's, pr there's probably more evidence against Donna, given the check writing, given the comment about the two of us, and also the vitriolic emails that she sent in 2013 about converting the kids to mm -hmm. Catholicism or they're dressing up in Hitler youth garb or the bribes. Those emails were all from Donna. Charlie goes on and on about those in the jailhouse calls saying, what does that have to do with me? Those, I didn't write those emails. I mean, we all know what has to, we all know what it has to do with you, but Donna, th there's a lot of evidence against Donna. Yeah. A <laughs> lot. Can, can Joel, Casey, what about the conscience of guilt, her fleeing with a one-way ticket to Vietnam? I mean, that's pretty powerful evidence. She knew yeah. she was doing something wrong. Yeah. Well, let's, let's listen to that call right now. Since Dave just mentioned it, it is right here. Who? Oh. Really? Good. Maybe bring it up over and over. Could things change if there is extradition from Vietnam? Because we, we've looked at all the places. I mean, I could go to Korea and China, but there's no extradition. But we're looking for places where there's no extradition. Yeah, Who? Really? Good. Maybe she knows about. Maybe she can look up the extradition issue yeah. before we waste, waste our time. If she can tell on you that my parents are thinking of leaving the country. My lawyer told us to do that. Okay, but if you mention it to Wendy, is Wendy going to tell somebody? Well, you, you tell her beforehand. I need to tell you something as as an attorney who doesn't doesn't talk and has nothing to do with the case. Just pause it right there. Uh, Dennis Murphy, you're the closest we're going to get to a psychologist on this panel. Uh, what do you make of this, her state of mind? And uh, I mean, this is definitely what they call consciousness of guilt. She's looking for a way, you know, to get out of Dodge. Why don't these people shut up, Joel? I mean, they just <laughs> keep talking themselves into one bear trap after another. Uh, I, I mean, I, I, don't, I, I think you can almost say goodnight with that call there. I mean, she's looking around for places that can take them in, get them out of the rain, really ex no extradition. Yeah. Uh, and Dennis, they didn't buy a two-way ticket. They had the money to fly private. They bought a one-way ticket. One-way ticket with a stop. Where was, was my Nancy stop? Grace? I didn't, even mean, I didn't even mean to sound like Nancy Grace right there, but I just did. <laughs> um, I mean, what were they thinking? Dave Ehrenberg, what were they thinking buying a one-way ticket, Dave? Dennis is right. They're just not thinking. They, they think they're smarter than everyone else. They think they're above the law. And they're not good at this. They, they're new to this. And they just know what they see on Law and & Order. It's like, all right, I guess it's time for us to flee to a country. Let's go. And I will bet you when she walked into that airport and walked on the jetway, the last thing she thought was that she'd be stopped on the jetway by someone saying, Miss Adelson, that I would have loved to have been a fly on the wall right then and there. Oh, great moment. Great moment. Right? Yeah. I wish that your cameras were there, Dennis. Oh, I I, I, I've been looking for somebody's iPhone to come up with it, but nobody got it. You know, they must, they must yeah. have, uh, they must have put her somewhere in a very quiet area because I cannot believe that no one has that on film. But um, so from they Sam, probably went I up am there. Joel. They probably went up there. They didn't, and they just said, "We'd like to speak with you." And yeah. then, yeah. So they they didn't want to alert everyone around to have a big scene. Yeah, By the way, 100%. do we know who the tipster is? This friend of many years, sort of a family acquaintance rather than a friend who. Called Leon County and said, "Hey, this is going down." Is John Singer, do you have any idea? I, I no, I don't. I, we, I, from what I've heard, it's a female, but beyond that, I don't know. So I, you know, and I don't know that the, those people know. But um, turned out to Sam, be a worthy tip. Yeah, that would be a great tip. Um, Sam, I am. Uh, this is interesting. John Singer, do you think Charlie would have ever been looked at if Wendy had never said his name to the police? Yes, because Jeff Lacasse came into the police station uh, the following day, and then he came in three days later, and then he came in several months later, and he was, I mean, I've listened to those, I wouldn't call those interrogations, more colloquy between Jeff Lacasse and the, and, the, and the Tallahassee Police Department. He makes a very compelling case that Charlie was the orchestrator of this. He said, if you're going to look at anybody, look at this guy, Charlie Adelson. He said, I had a bad feeling about him when I met him over spring break in March of 2014. Um, he made some statements to me in the hot tub.
that I thought were were quite troubling. He's and, and he he went on and on about why, as a a, a social worker and as a psychologist, um, or th- that he believed that Charlie was capable of something like this. So I think if if Wendy hadn't offered up that Charlie had made that you know that joke about the TV costing less than the hitman, I think Jeff Lacasse would have done Charlie in anyway. Hmm. Uh, Six Toad Pete. Best guest in true crime, and as I always tell Dave Ehrenberg and the rest of the people, it ain't just a tagline. It's our reality. The panel's outstanding. There you go. Uh, someone's going to have to – I hate to do this to Kim, but this is my favorite comment of the day. Someone's going to have to tell Kim. She says, what a great panel. Josh Mankiewicz is in the house. <laughs> How awesome. <laughs> He'd love it. I wish Mank would tweet that out. Um, yeah. This is Dennis Murphy. This is way better than Mank. This is uh, – no, Mank on maybe. crack right here, Dennis Murphy. Mank, Mank, Mank is my bro. I was just on a podcast with him right before this. I, I will never oh. say anything poor about him. And she's right. He should be here. Let me tell you something. Josh Mankiewicz signed two mugs for us to give away to STS Nation at Crime. Where, well, how come you weren't at Crime Con, Dennis? Was that the last? Where was the last one? In the last Orlando? one was Orlando. Um, I don't think Dateline went as a group. I think I think uh, Josh was a Lone Ranger because he likes to be a bold faced name. I think he, he is um, a very intelligent guy. Him and Shane Bishop were there. Shout out to Shane yeah, Bishop. Good guys, great, both. Great, great guy. So uh, this is the last piece of tape. Um, in about nine minutes, our friends Dave and uh, John Singer are going to have to run. And maybe Josh Mankiewicz, a.k.a. Dennis Murphy, will stick around for a few extra. So start writing some questions if you have them for Dennis Murphy. But let's listen to this piece of sound. So we've been really good nannies, and I oh, guess yeah. our job is up. Because now the boys are older, they can go out with friends, they can do things on their own. So she doesn't need grandma and grandpa. Okay, pretty hurtful. I have one son that I don't speak with. I have one son who's close to being dead. And my daughter, whom I love, is doing this. I don't get it. I don't get it. I said to Harvey, I swear to God, our family was cursed. Uh, Dennis Murphy, our family is cursed. I have one son, you know, that's a strange, I don't speak to the other one <clears throat> close to being dead. I mean, you know, Dennis, it's, it's hard not to feel emotion here. This is just a, as you said, a Shakespearean tragedy. Yeah, This but, is uh, where, this is where Shakespeare enters the room, isn't it? Yeah. hundred percent. But you know, what, 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 what do you glean from this? If anything, I think it's an x-ray. It's a psychological profile of where this woman is at, and nobody would want to be in her shoes. But I don't understand how she doesn't understand how, how they got there. Uh, why can't they read the room? Uh, going right back to the beginning of all of this. Uh, that, that That's a great point, Dennis. I mean, it's like, woe is me, but absolutely no accountability, right, Dennis? And does does anybody in that family believe the defense that was offered, that WTF defense that came up no. out of the blue? He was no. extorted, up was down, east was west. Everything has been different no. than you've heard for nine years. Mm. How could they believe that if they're giving – are they giving lip service to that, that they're standing by it? I guess they have to. They they, they really don't talk about that much on or at all on, on the recordings I've heard. It, it's more about how the evidence was allegedly flimsy – they took things out of context from Wendy's book. They took text messages out of context. Yeah. The birthday present for Harvey wasn't really the murder. It was Paella. That um, Donna really wasn't going to do the thing she said she was going to do in the emails about converting the boys. That was just her venting. It's it's really just attacking the alleged flimsiness of the evidence. They, they never reiterate or talk about the extortion plot. But I think they think... And that that email or, or that that commentary from Donna, they blame they blame Dan Markell for this. If it weren't for Dan Markell, they wouldn't have had been in this predicament. Their grandchildren wouldn't have been stuck in Tallahassee. They wouldn't have had to make that drive eight hours for the next sixteen years. Dan Markell thrust them into this situation. They did what they did. They put that in the deepest recesses of their mind. They've completely blocked it out. Um, in, in their own conversations with one another. And she believes they're cursed when, in fact, she's the cause of it all. She's the cause of Rob Adelson not speaking with them. She's the cause of her own son being close to death. She's the cause of everything. So I had no sympathy. I'm a pretty sympathetic person, although my wife may disagree. I, I was <laughs> devoid of entire sympathy. The sympathy goes to the Markells, not to her.
And Joel, Joel, this reminds me of the old story of the defendant who killed both his parents and then pleads for mercy from the court because he's an orphan. Yes. That's what this yes. reminds me. Yeah. By the yeah, way, guys, right. I was I was impressed with Charlie's performance of this crazy defense. Mm, he yes. sort of did an ad lib for how long was that? And he's buttoning up every crossing every T, buttoning every I. The you know the gift to the father. He knows the, the the call that the mother's out on the free. He's got it all down. He's got an answer for everything. In fact, I started to worry towards the end. If you're only fishing for one confused juror, did he achieve it? You know, by speaking out to almost everything. If you step back, it's crazy stuff. But mm. I agree with you. I, I thought maybe you. he was going to get away with it. Uh, uh, I, I, I thought that there was a chance of a hung jury. And in fact, he, he did get, you know, one of the alternates, obviously, that Joel was and, and everyone in the courtroom was concerned about, who seemed to be making some, you know, odd gestures and gesticulations. Eyes, yeah. yeah, he apparently was uh, on the favor or, or on the side of acquittal. But I think Charlie had a year and a half um, in that prison cell in Leon County, uh, in the Leon County Jail, to think about his testimony and he's a repetitive person. He's obviously has a good memory. He had nothing else to think about, but that, and he put on a good performance, but at the end of the day, the theory made no sense and the evidence was overwhelming and that was it. And that, and that's got the same thing with Donna. And in retrospect, some say he put on too good a performance. He was almost too rehearsed. Ned Smith mm -hmm. echoing what uh, John Singer just said, the Adelsons are the curse. Uh, here's a question. Uh, we'll toss this to you, Dave. Charlie perseverates, that's a good word. Singer knows what that means, about losing time with his son. The irony. Um, he's talking about losing time with his son. Uh, the Markells never will have time with their father. Uh, they lost that July 18th, 2014. Well, really July 19th. But uh, what do you make of that, of, of him being on those calls talking about that, Dave? Sure sounds like they're sociopaths. Uh, I think John's right. I think they blame Danny, Danny Markell for the fact that their family's curse is ruined. And by the way, I'm going to be looking up that word. I'm not familiar with perseverates. I'm just going to check it Well done, Annie Kay. But, a, you know, it's, a, it's a Sunday right. crossword word. Yeah. <laughs> um, <laughs> if it doesn't fit into a wordle, I, I really don't know it. Five <laughs> You know, to think that your your family is cursed, I and mean, you're the ones who sold Babe Ruth, dude, right? I mean, th there's a reason why your family is going through this. You're the one who rejected your son because he married outside the faith, and you're the ones who put the hit on the, uh, the husband of your daughter, and that's why everything is cascading around you. And so it is really the act and the beliefs of a of sociopaths that think that, oh, woe is me. Look at this. The, the, it, there's a storm cloud hanging over me. Yeah, you're the one who salted that cloud. Mm. You know, uh, by the way, go ahead, John. Well, uh, real quickly, uh, 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 someone's asking about Wendy's new boyfriend. She does have a new boyfriend. The only thing I know is his name is George, as in Jorge, <laughs> J-O-R-G-E. And someone said, I wonder if he's another undercover cop. And he sort of looks <laughs> like one. Um, he's a pretty strong guy, shaved head. So he almost... Uh, he almost uh, fits the bill. Look at this. Dennis Murphy, happy holidays from Tappy Cat. Go ahead, John. I, I was just going to pick up on, because there was a question about, um, or a comment about Charlie's son, and, and what Dennis was saying um, earlier about how it was heart-wrenching for the Markells to have to listen to the calls back in 16 when Donna was with the boys, um, and she was be, she'd be talking to Charlie, and then the boys would be in the background. They were young at the time, and the, the Markells were prevented from seeing them for the ensuing six years, but you, you had a sort of a similar situation on the jailhouse calls where Charlie was on the phone with Bree, um, who is the mother of his son, Roman. She was, uh, she had been the nanny of, uh, for Wendy's ex-boyfriend, Dave at the time, his kids, but you heard Roman in the background, Charlie's talking to Bree. And in the background, you hear Roman sort of whimpering or, or, or laughing or whatever he was doing. He's, he's going to turn six pretty soon. And, and just, again, you, you went from the calls where the, the Markel boys were, were small and they were in the background. And now you go to Roman, who's the same age. And there's so many victims. There, there's so many children here who've been victimized. The ripples that Dennis spoke about earlier, it, it really is tragic. You have to feel for Charlie's son. You have to. I mean, it's, it's going to grow up with a father in prison the rest of his life. He's an innocent kid. And just another casualty of this heinous crime. Well, I'm not persuaded that Charlie cared at all about, you know, his nephews. I don't think he cared at all about Wendy's boys. He wanted his his mother to get off his back. You know, that's it. 
That's enough it. already. I'll take care yeah. of this problem. Just shut up. You know, we'll, we'll exactly. Move on. Exactly. Um, Lisa, this is interesting. Harvey never speaks. Dave Arenberg, uh, what kind of culpability, if any, legally do you think Harvey's facing? Or is he the one that gets away scot free? He could, but remember, he was in the first audio tape before Dolce Vita. Charlie and Harvey had a conversation, and so that's some evidence that he was in on it. And then there's the Conscious of guilt, the one-way ticket. And, you know, could you believe that it was just Donna who was dropping off the laundered money? When I say laundered, I mean literally laundered. Yeah, a wet bag of cash. <laughs> he went back at, and Harvey wasn't involved in it? I mean, perhaps. I do think that of all the individuals in the family, as of right now, I think he is the least likely to be charged. But that could change depending on what they've got on the calls and other evidence that could uh, come up. We'll see. Uh, by the way, uh, Karan, Michael, or Karen, I'm not sure if she just spelled differently. Does anyone know if they know all these audios are out there? As far as I know, these are the audio uh, calls that are out there. But keep in mind, there's going to be jailhouse calls uh, from Donna as well. And uh, I'm sure people are going to get their hands on those. By the way, these were not released from the uh, sheriff's office. Got donuts. Joel, have you ever heard a call between Donna and Charlie where they throw Wendy under the bus because she visited the crime scene? Yes, we did. Uh, John, speak to that, and I'm going to let you go because I know you and Dave have to run. And, uh, Dennis, you mind hanging on a few minutes? No, I'm, I'm good, Joel. I'll be happy to stay with you. Okay. Yeah. So if anyone has questions for Dennis, now is your time to get a real-life Dateline correspondent put in uh, the triple Q, and I will get him to Dennis. Go ahead, John. And I'll have Josh do uh, a mug. Yeah. <laughs> I, 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 ha I, I did listen to those calls, and, and they're actually, at, at one point, they're – they're speaking about how Wendy went to the crime, you know, visited the crime scene, how that was a powerful piece of evidence. But at the same time, they were talking about how, you know, that Charlie said said on one of the calls that he goes to the same liquor store all the time, even though it's it's out of the way for him. It's just the only liquor store he knows. And they said the same thing about Wendy, like, yeah, she took the circuitous route because at the end of the day, it's the only liquor store she'd ever been to. And Charlie said, you know. I go to the same post office all the time. I go to the same liquor store. So uh, they weren't throwing Wendy under the bus per se. They were mentioning it. Well, and there goes his uh, connection. Dave, you want to finish that up? Dave, he really had to go. The wife was like, I've oh. had it. That timer expired. <laughs> yeah, that happens in prison too. You know, you only pay for so many minutes. <laughs> uh, there was a previous... Um, writer who wrote in that uh harvey along with uh donna dropped off the money i, I wasn't aware of that that they dropped off together but if they were both in the car together when the money was dropped off then yeah they can go after him just the same like prosecutors can go after everyone in a conspiracy all you need is one overt act you need an agreement and an overt act and the overt act has to be anyone in the conspiracy doing the overt act even if it's not harvey he could go down for the overt act of others as long as he was part of the conspiracy. So we shall see. And I think, Joel, my, my last thing is I'd love to plug my new um, YouTube page, which is Dave Ehrenberg FL. Dave mm. Ehrenberg FL, please. There, there you go. Good. And uh, Dave, um, I should not be correcting a Harvard guy, but moving forward, I know you're new to this. It's your YouTube channel, not your page, Dave. So make sure you get that right. <laughs> At least uh, you can tell I'm still new to this. At That's least. right. Well, you know what? I upgraded I uh, from my MySpace page. Um, and, um, and, so, and but I'm also on Friendster. If you follow me on Friendster. Uh, and, uh, just <laughs> Look at this. Ned Smith hit the nail on the head. The fastest 90 minutes of your entire life. I caution you about watching too much of the show. Your life will go too quickly. But thank you, uh, Ned. And this is. Dave Arenberg is going to be here. Dennis Murphy, not Josh Mankiewicz, is going to be here. Ruth Markell will be here, and I will be simply moderating. Uh, maybe I'll even have a little uh, drink and hang out and enjoy myself. We'll see. We'll see if my mother allows that uh, since I'm only in my 50s now. <laughs> um, Dave Arenberg, you're a mensch. Thank you for doing this. I'm going to see you on uh, Wednesday night. Thank you. I'll see you, and I'll see you, Dennis. Looking see forward you. to it. See you Wednesday, Dave. Good. Looking forward to it. Take care, Thanks, guys. Thanks, Dave. Uh, Dennis, right into this. We're not missing a beat. We'll go just a few more minutes because Dennis is a busy guy, too. What was the most significant, memorable case that you covered during your tenure at Dateline? Wow, that's a tough one. I think the one that had a lot of moving parts 
And, and we called it the back staircase. And this was the writer in North Carolina mm. whose wife was found in a bloody heap at the bottom of the staircase. And did he did he bludgeon her to death or not? What happened uh, with that crime? Michael Peterson case. Yeah. Uh, it went on and on and on, ended up in an Alfred plea. I thought that was, I, I was fascinated by that. I think yeah. I like the stories best, Joel, where I really don't know what happened, where I yeah. really can't see the movie. And, and that was my and, I, and, and that one I really couldn't see. I don't know whether he did it or not. Yeah. And what about this case? What's so intriguing to you about this particular case? Well, the uh, the the two aspects I was talking about before that is it's a CSI procedural for eight years or so mm-hmm. until we get to the end of Magbanawa, and it's all very great police work. And then you end up, then we're in this whole new era. It's it's Charlie. It's Donna. Wither Wither. Uh, uh, you know Harvey and the and the daughter and and uh, I, I mean it's just fast. I don't. I'm looking forward to the book, the novel of this. I'm not sure you can really tell it in a true crime book. You need somebody to get under the skull of that family and how this thing happened. Yeah, a lot of people are asking me now, which is very uh, kind of interesting and thought provoking about Donna's childhood, and I really don't know much, but I'm starting to get people to reach out who may know. Uh, people want to know about the kind of the psychopathology of this family. So if anyone has info on Donna's early years, surviving the survivor at Gmail. But um, this question from Nancy, Dennis, how do you do your job every day and not get jaded? Thank you for all your work. Because you, this is the this is the tip of the iceberg. I've got so many people, smart people behind me who are playing zone defense and talking to prosecutors in Texas and Louisiana, and they make me a lot brighter than I need to be. Um, I, I mean, you, you, you tend to shake it off. I think for me, I, I'm, I, I'm d- delivered these puzzles and I got to figure out how to structure it. How do I tell it? You could tell any Dateline story in three minutes and you'd be done, but how do you, how do you keep it interesting? Uh, and I think that whole process of telling the story removes you a little bit from the awfulness of the crime. Um, mm-hmm. uh, I'm going to give away a little secret, Dennis, but one thing that I have noticed with my uh, broadcast news eyes since the pandemic, uh, prior to the pandemic, correspondents were always interviewing in person. But now, every once in a while, I'll catch uh, an interviewee (laughs) with an IFB, which tends lends me to believe that you've got a a photographer, but you might be somewhere else. Is that happening a little more often now? Uh, It's happening less than it did in 2020, 2021. I mean, when we definitely did that. I'd be in a hotel room lobby somewhere mm. and uh, with, with the cameraman and they would bring in through special Zoom. It was like Zoom goes to Harvard uh, <laughs> to have an enhanced signal. And uh, and you talk to them. And I was surprised at how well it did. I mean, it's up to you. You, you be the, the judge, Joel. But I think we, you get pretty close to having a normal conversation with somebody. Yeah, it's it's sometimes even, even when even when we're together in the same room with all the paraphernalia, you know, in a the cameras and lights and all the, you know, it's still a very unnatural situation. So it's just slightly less natural. Mm. Uh, Tia, when you mentioned this a little earlier, I think you said January, but when will the next Dateline episode on uh, the Dan Markell case be televised, do you think? Well, I hope it's us before the other guys. Uh, I'm looking at my calendar here and I've got a Friday in January circled. And I've got me ordering a lot of super extra strength tums in the in the days going backwards, so so we can make the deadline. Uh, but we'll get it done. We have a team working on it right now. I just tracked uh, the first six acts yesterday, mm. so we'll get to twelve. Our shows are twelve acts, uh, but I think I think we're going to be in overtime in this thing, Joel. I don't think this is going to be the last story by any stretch. No, this the case keeps going here. I am not T Pain is one of our uh, beloved mods. Uh, what is the case? This is a little different than what was asked before, but what's the case that has impacted you maybe personally the most, that's touched you the most? Oh, I don't know. I mean, as a, as a, as a rule, I try to r- remove myself from it. You know, I, I would say it's probably not a Dateline thing. It was when I was doing news all the time and we had an awful volcano erupt in Colombia mm. and they were pulling bodies out of the street and, you know, and it was, it was just a dread. They turned this, this part of Colombia into Pompeii and we did the stories and we got through it. And it's that same kind of de- deflect of you tell a story. And then, but I remember on the 
plane home just sort of coming undone a little bit, thinking about it all when I had that distance from it. And and that wasn't a dateline, but it's the same kind of thing. You know, when when you get a little distance from it, you you, you see how how dreadful these things are. A hundred percent. Uh Paul Dalnaki, what's Keith Morrison really like? The question everyone wants to know. What you see is what you get. He is a great guy. He's as smart as a whip and he's kind and really has nothing to do with that whole Bill Hader persona. Oh, there's a trunk in the car. And we all feel as bad as we can for him because he's he's lost his son and been the focal point of the world's grief and attention. Yeah. Mm. Keith is a great guy. He's an absolutely great guy. Yeah, uh, Believe it or not, my wife interned for Keith and says the exact same thing. Um, so uh, she speaks very highly of him, the COE, that is. Question for Dennis. Do you see a comparison with Wendy and Lori Vallow? Both had their brothers kill their exes. Uh, it's interesting. I'm not, I'm not a scholar on true crime. I don't know the Lori case. Um, yeah, the Lori case. So she's the doomsday mother out of uh, Idaho. And, and, oh, right. And, right. Yeah. So uh, they're, they're, I think that they're similar but different. Uh, this is an important question. And then we'll start to wrap this up. Dennis, now that you're semi-retired, what do you like to do in your free time? Great question. Uh, read for pleasure at my swimming pool in South Florida, hopefully on a sunny day. I've, I, I'm still very busy. I just finished up my calendar for this year and I worked a lot of, I worked more days than I did when I was on staff. Uh, so the retirement hasn't really come, but I look forward to the time of not having to make an appointments, not ever having to see the Atlanta airport again, unless it's my choice. Uh, <laughs> yeah. and, and, and reading, reading not true crime, but fiction of uh, favorite detectives and such. Uh, Lindsay wants to know, um, how does Dateline know when to release the episodes? Uh, this case must have been a tough one to schedule with all the breaking news. I'm not going to say the competitor, but they missed Donna's arrest by releasing too early. That's interesting. So what's the strategy in terms of uh, release dates? Well, you, you look and see how much you can do. Will, will it be a worthy show? in the time allowed. When Charlie got taken down, I think we had maybe two days before our Friday show, and we just didn't think we were going to have everything we wanted to have in place. It wasn't going to be as good a show as we expect of ourselves. Uh, the other guys went with it. No no, no, no blame or anything, but uh, I think if we hold on to stuff a little bit longer, we give you a different show than the other guys do. We tell you a story. Hmm. Someone was asking Armand Fence if you think there's any way that Wendy could repair her public image at this point, or has the uh, horse left the barn, Dennis? Uh, public crisis, public relations intervention for Wendy. I don't think that's one I want to get. I want to get into. You you wonder what what the future is going to be for all of these people. For Charlie, it's going to be bologna sandwiches till the end of time. Does Donna have anything to go if she can? get out of these charges? What, is she going to go back to South Beach and play pickleball? I mean, mm. you can't imagine anybody going for it. And I, I include Wendy in that. I mean, she is in a Brandeis law degree, very, very bright woman, but mm. again, one of these family members that can't seem to read the room. Uh, Titanic can. Two more questions, and we'll wrap it up. Yeah. Who picks uh, which stories you're going to cover, the crimes and the stories that you're going to cover? How do you decide on those? Well, we have what I call the Politburo. There are, you know, seven or eight senior people that sit around, and there's a person who presents every day. Says this is this is the day in crime, and it could probably be a a great cable show. And it's we'll take one of those, we'll take two of those, get Murphy on that, get Keith and Josh over here, and uh, and off we go. Uh, mm -hmm. but I have I, ha I have a Dateline story for you. Uh, Dennis, I'm going to pitch, which I think you know already because it's coming up. It's I'm being reminded of it here. McRamblon says, what unsolved case, Dennis, have you covered that you would like to see solved most? Unsolved? Yes. Other than the Kennedy assassination? Yes. Uh, <laughs> unsolved case. Well, I don't think I've got any in my portfolio. I'd like to see this case get wrapped up, but I can't see the, I can't see the end of it coming. Uh so, Dennis, there's a case that we've been covering, Ellen Greenberg. I don't know if I mentioned this to you last time. She was a school teacher in Philadelphia 
She's found dead in 2010, the eve of a huge snowstorm. She's engaged, living with her fiance. And I'll send you the photo, Dennis. Right. She's stabbed 20 times, 10 to the back of the neck, 10 to the front. An independent autopsy shows that two of her stab wounds were uh, inflicted after she was killed, mm. uh, after she died. And uh, that was a little Freudian slip right there. So after she died, um, the fiance's uncle is a very prominent judge, very highly connected. And uh, it was initially ruled a homicide. Then it was ruled undetermined and it was ultimately ruled a suicide despite being stabbed 20 times in positions that you can't reach. Um, it has never to this day been investigated because of that. And, uh, it's been kicked all around the Commonwealth of Pennsylvania. So I once asked how come Dateline hasn't picked this up and they said, um, and this is kind of the reality. Uh, there's no ending to the story. It never even went to trial. Nothing's happened. It's never been investigated, but it is, um, was, was it adjudicated as a suicide? Is it on the medical examiner's form? Um, it cause of death. It, cause of death is a suicide, but there's to the, I mean, ongoing to this, at this very moment, uh, the higher courts in Pennsylvania are taking it up and, uh, the family is all but certain going to eventually turn to a wrongful death suit. But, yeah. um, you know, there word. could be, there could be a great story there and people that need to be brought to count. But I, I think for us, probably the stumbling point would be if it's officially ruled a suicide to get mm -hmm. past that. Yeah, there you go. That's the answer from Dennis Murphy, but I'll, I'll keep Dennis in the loop on that. Dennis, you know, I cannot thank you enough. Uh, for Joel, coming thank on. you so much. And I'll see you on Tuesday night, huh? Uh, Wednesday. Wednesday, Wednesday night. night. Wednesday yeah, night. Wednesday, 7 p.m. It's in uh, uh, John Singer's, uh, especially in the side commentator. He's listened to the jailhouse calls and details. John is a very smart guy, as is Dennis, as is Dave. And Dennis and Dave are going to be in Sunrise, Florida with me. I'll put it up on Twitter at podcast SDS on Instagram at surviving the survivor. Cannot wait to meet Dennis Murphy in person until then one o'clock tomorrow. Love you, America. That's my homage to Geraldo, by the way, uh, Dennis Murphy. <laughs> love, love you, Florida and love you everywhere else until tomorrow. Dennis, hang on one second.